Last week was how do I deal with temptation? Um, again, you asked for it. We asked people to fill in the blank. How do I deal with fill in the blank? This week, our topic is how do I deal with family dysfunctions? So n- now, now you know why you should start praying for me, right? So um, if, if this is your first time here to Grace City Church um, and you were invited by a family member, <laughs> Well, n- now you know why you're here. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, so how do I deal with, with family dysfunctions? And really when I say family dysfunctions, that's just kind of a broad category that I created for dozens and dozens of questions that were very specific that we received. They were all kind of in relationship to, okay, now how do I deal with, with, with my stuff? This is a, how do I deal with stuff out there that I'm, that I'm closely connected to that's affecting who I am and how I am right here? And, and as I got thinking about this, the more complex it got because I thought, well, I, I want to stay high enough, you know, 30,000 feet, you know, principally so that I'm, I'm helpful to as many people as possible. But if I, if I get too high in just kind of general principles, I'll be helpful to nobody. But then if I get down into too many specifics, I feel like it'd be, I'd be helpful to like three or four, but not to everybody. And so it's the challenge of how do, you, how, how do you be helpful to as many people as possible without being so generic that you're really not helping anybody. And at the end of the day, there are some principles that we need to get under our belt, but there will be things in specifics that I, I can't give you because I don't know the, the dynamics of your family or the specifics of the situation. So I even hesitate to start giving too many specifics because if those specifics were applied wrongly or in the wrong situation, that might not be what's appropriate because uh, while the principles hold true and those don't change, how we uh, uh, apply them and how we walk those out in any given family situation uh, uh, might be a little different. And so that's where you need and I need and we need the Holy Spirit. We need the help of the Holy Spirit to know how to apply these principles in a godly way, in a Christ-honoring way, in a way that, that, that says, I'm for Jesus and love Jesus and walking in the power of Jesus, because you can take the principles of God and beat people's head uh, over the head with them, and that's not godly. You might be right intellectually, but wrong how you're living it out, and, and, which means is, is an, it's a net loss. And so I, I want to, I, I don't know if you're feeling the tension I'm in yet, but, but I'm like, man, okay, I don't want to be so generic that I'm not helpful, so specific that I'm, I'm not helpful. And so uh, I'm praying that I can kind of fly over the top of the issues and give you some generic prin- uh, general principles to, to have under your feet. And then I'm going to exhort you to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit as you apply them to your family. Because at the end of the day, we all came from dysfunctional families, okay? So a couple things to, uh, to did you write that down, Mom? <laughs> <laughs> this could be funner than I thought. Okay, I, 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 a couple things to to uh, to just kind of set the table as we as we get started here. Number one, recognize the power of family. Let's just recognize the power of family. When God created man and woman, he put them into a family, okay? Before the, there was a church, there was the family. The family is the core, the center, the, 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 the nucleus of, of society, of community, of humanity. Family's a big deal. And so you should never minimize your family or, or not think that your family of origin is a big deal. There's been nothing that has shaped you more profoundly than the home you grew up in. Good or bad, right or wrong, present dad, not present dad, the home that you grew up in has radically shaped who you are to this day. It shaped, it shaped how you think, it shaped how you view the world, it shaped how you view gender roles, it shaped how you view conflict, it shaped how you uh, viewed conflict resolution, it shaped how you viewed attachment, how you attach or relate to other people, it shaped how you view everything in your life. I mean, scientifically, I mean, there are, are, are hundreds of millions of neurons that, that, that are, are making connections and storing memories that are making hundreds of trillions of relational connections in how you respond to any given moment in life, and you're never more impressionable than when you're a child. So, you know, Jim and Rich has been teaching us the last several months as leadership team that the, the permeability of the soul God designed the soul to be permeable, so you're absorbing the relational atmosphere of your family. Because when it's, when it's being redeemed and you're in a godly home, that gives the parents an edge in a good way. Because they have more ability to influence that child than any other voice, which is a wonderful thing redeemed. But when it's broken by sin, it has the opposite effect. They're absorbing all the negativity and all the sinful patterns and choices of the parents. And so, so you just couldn't, I couldn't, I could not I could not overstate the, this morning the power of family. 
That's not to say you're a victim of your family, but it is to say nothing has more profoundly shaped you than your family. So let's just recognize that as a room and let's say, okay, good or bad, that's a thing. That's a reality. Number two, recognize you're not alone. Every family has its stuff, okay? And I, I, I get this from, uh, I was, as I was looking through kind of where to go uh, this week, Chaz reminded me, he said, well, don't forget to redo him, uh, Jesus' genealogy. I was like, that's, that's a great thought. And so if you got your Bibles, you could open to Matthew chapter 1 because we're going to be kind of in, in Matthew chapter you know, 1 through 8 a little bit here this morning. But if you just open up the book of Matthew, this is, this is, this is the first book of the New Testament. It's about three quarters of the way through your Bible. If you can't find it, you just go to the index in front and look for Matthew, and it'll tell you what page number to go to. You go to Matthew, it's the first gospel. These are the first words written, spoken. This is the first revelation from God in, in, in 400 years of silence. We haven't heard a thing from God. There's been no scripture written. And now we get uh, Matthew, who's writing the gospel of Matthew, telling the story of Jesus. And he begins with these words. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then what he proceeds to do for a, a multiplicity of reasons is to articulate and identify Jesus' family of origin. He starts with Abraham, then he goes all the way through to Jacob, the father of Joseph, Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called Messiah. Thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile of Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. What's the point? There's lots of different very important, profound reasons why Matthew starts there. But for our sake this morning, here's the big takeaway. Every family's got their stuff, even Jesus' family. If you read through Jesus' family, whoops, excuse me, here's what you're going to find. Drunkards, idolaters, greedy, materialists, ungodly, whores, prostitutes, murderers, thieves, like Every, everything you can imagine is in Jesus' genealogy. Every iniquity, every sin, every dysfunction. I mean, I mean David alone covers like 80% of the, of, of, the, of the ground when it comes to sin, right? You want to talk about like a neurotic, dysfunctional family, just look at David's family. I could do a whole sermon series on, on the dysfunctional family that David came from and then reproduced, and he was called a man for God's own heart. It's crazy. It's crazy. So, so just acknowledge here that, that you're not alone. Every family has its stuff because every family is full of humans and every human is broken by the fall. So well, let's not sit here and think that we're victims, we're the only one who's going through this. No, Jesus can identify with you, right? And let's not think, oh, my family has no issues, you just haven't looked hard enough, <laughs> okay? So hopefully that kind of levels the ground for us here as we move in. So here's how I'm gonna go about this morning. In the short amount of time I have, I just picked three general questions. Like I said, we got dozens and dozens regard. I picked three that, that got repeated the most and that hopefully covered the most amount of ground. Okay, fair enough. You know, when you preach on this, you can organize it however you want. This, this is how I did it. So, so we'll see if this helps or not. Question number one, how do I deal with overbearing in-laws and controlling parents? Well, this is about to get real, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we got that question a lot. So as your pastor, because I love you, we're going to talk about it. So that's the question. Number one, the honor principle. You need to write this down. The honor principle. Whenever you're dealing with family members, you know, parents or in-laws, you have to keep at the forefront of your mind the honor principle. We look to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Now, how many of you in this room are children? Okay, that's kind of how the whole thing works, right? Good, you're awake. Okay, that's good. Now, the, the, the delineation I want to make here is that, that this word children, in, as Paul uses it in Ephesians, refers to a little child, a small child, Okay. And so the obligation here that Paul puts on the little child is to obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Meaning they have a th authority in your life to tell you what to do and not to do. That, that, that's your responsibility as a small child. But then that small child grows up and is still a child. I'm still a child of Gray and Kenny McPherson, but I'm not a child like I was when I was nine. Okay? We now interact and relate very differently to each other 
uh, as adults. It's more of a peer friendship relationship. However, this next sentence, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may go well with you in the land, you may enjoy long life on the earth, that is a responsibility that, that is never removed from, from the child, the grown child. So the small child has a, has a, a, a responsibility for a period of time while they're in, under the authority of the parents to obey the parents as long as the parents aren't asking them to disobey Jesus. And then when that child grows up and moves out of the home and gets married, they have now a different relationship to their parents. They are no longer obligated to live under the authority of their parents, but they are obligated by God to honor them all the days of their life. That's a very important distinction to make. And oftentimes when you have overbearing parents, overbearing in-laws, and you want to follow Jesus, you want to be faithful to God's word, you come to this text or text, you're like, oh, well, I guess we should do, no, no. You are obligated to do nothing your parents say as a grown adult married. Nothing. In fact, you have an obligation to assure that their attempt to exercise authority in your life isn't successful. Otherwise, that will destroy your marriage. And so now you're in this tension because I want to honor my parents, but, but, but they're actively working against other principles of God that should be happening in my marriage that will, that will tear our relationship apart, which means you've got a, an issue on your hand, which is why you wrote so many of these questions to me. So I'm just starting out here. Whatever, however you navigate that situation, which we'll get into some specifics in a moment, you can never not honor them. You can, never, you can never be disrespectful to them. You should never be talking ill about them to others. You should never be you know, spreading malicious rumors or gathering a coalition against them. Whatever you do, you should be honoring to them, even if you have to have hard conversations, even if you have to make hard decisions, even if you have to do some what feels like unloving things toward them to keep their toxicity from poisoning your marriage, you, you must never not always be honoring them. Okay, So I just want to put that on the table and be sure that is heard this morning. There is no obligation from a grown child who's in a marriage to be under the authority of their parents. In fact, if they are, that's a very unhealthy situation. And there will be overbearing, domineering, strong personality parents who want to exercise authority, or there will be sick parents because of their own idolatry, their children cannot let their children go. That doesn't mean that you become a victim to their toxicity and their sickness and their idolatry. It does mean you, you still honor them. Okay, so this can be very difficult and very, very hard, but we've got to keep the honor piece on the table. Okay, whatever you do, whatever you say, that is still in view all the time. Doesn't mean you can't have hard conversations or say hard things or do some things that are painful, but you're always honoring them. And, and they sometimes will see it, sometimes they won't, sometimes they'll accuse you of this or that, whatever. You need to know in your heart before God, I've honored them, I've respected them, um, and I, I bless them but I do not allow their sickness to, to poison my marriage. So honor principle number one. The second principle is the separation principle. Uh, Genesis chapter two, verse 24. For this reason, a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. That might be one of the most important verses in the Bible. There's lots of important verses in the Bible. That's one of them. You should know that one. When God's laying out the foundations of relationships in, in marriage, he, sa- he says this. And, it, and it's the principle of leave and cleave, meaning... When a husband and wife marry, they are forming now a new household. And the reality of it is that, that God made and designed the marriage and the household to thrive in an atmosphere of separation. Which means if your marriage is going to be healthy and whole, whether it's a young marriage or an old marriage, it has to function and thrive and, and, and grow in an atmosphere of separation from the authority of both your parents. Now, you don't think, you don't, if you may disagree with me, that's fine, but... but The reality of it is, God, men could probably get away with this. Men could live in a dorm with a bunch of other couples and be like, this is great. God made women territorial, didn't he? And that's that's by God's design. Women couldn't do marriage in a dorm with a bunch of other women letting them decorate their dorm room. I mean, that's, that's, that's a recipe for World War III, right? God made women territorial so that they would have a, a need and a desire to, to hang up their own pictures on the wall and paint their own colors on the wall and, and, and do their own meal planning and have their own little space that's theirs and that's good and that's right. And when an overbearing or domineering in-law or parent is sticking their nose into the business of, of their marriage, it feels, they don't, they don't need to know biblical principles, they don't need to know the Bible, it feels intuitively like a violation because it is. It's a violation of the sovereignty of that new marriage, of that new household, of that new family. Because God designed marriage to thrive in, a, in, a, in, in an atmosphere separated from the household they came from. 
doesn't mean they're not honoring that household they came from. doesn't mean they're not learning from or seeking counsel and advice from the household they came from. It simply means that, that they're not still attached by an umbilical cord emotionally to that former household. A new household has begun. And that, that new marriage, that new household will never thrive if the cord never gets cut emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically to the former family. Okay, this is the principle of separation. It means, it means the husband and wife must leave their family of origin emotionally, physically, spiritually, mentally, and then cling to each other. Because if they don't, if they don't do the first leaving, they can't do the second clinging. They can't. It's impossible. And disagree with me if you want, but I got thousands of hours of counseling situations and a ton of godly counsel on my side of the fence going, yeah, it's true. It just is. You will not find a healthy, godly, life-giving, thriving, flourishing marriage where one or both spouses have failed to leave their former households so they can cling to each other. Because if you do not leave, you cannot cling. And the challenge is some uh, 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 spouses don't want to leave. It happens with, with guys often, right? The mom's overbearing or strong, and she's always made his soup this way and folded his socks this way. And he kind of likes having a mom to mother him and get his stuff done. And it's great having a wife because now you've got a girl that you can have sex with, so you get the best of both worlds, a mom to pamper me and a woman to have sex with, and he just thinks that's fine. No, that's sick. You need, to, you, need, you need to gently, lovingly, in an honoring way, tell your mom, we're done. I don't need a mom anymore. I have a wife, and I can't have both. Okay? The wife will feel violated. The wife will feel um, uh, 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 vulnerable, unprotected, uncherished, and there will become a bitterness growing in her that will eat her alive and destroy your marriage. I guarantee it. For the wife, maybe it's like, oh, you know, I love my mom and dad, and they're great. If she doesn't leave her family and cling to her husband, he will feel like he's second fiddle to her family, and he will become bitter. He will, he will, he will become angry at her family because he will intuitively know that they, they are robbing him of having her. And it might not be their fault. It might be her. She hasn't left. I mean, you see how complicated this gets? <laughs> Still praying for me? This is, this is, this is a, lot of, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of challenges here to, 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 to navigate and negotiate. But the bottom line is a husband and a wife must leave their families in order to be able to cling rightly to one another, okay? Now, I didn't have this problem in my family because, because, because leaving was not a problem for me. I got kicked out, <laughs> okay? Like, poo, you know? And so that, that's never been an issue. Um, but I realize now the genius of my, of, of my mom and dad is, is they, they wanted to be sure that I felt the freedom to go cling to my spouse because I'm a relational guy, I love my family, and I, I, w- I would probably stay around too long and stay too close. And so they actively kind of, you know, there's the door. And I'm like, ooh, kind of cold out here, you know what I mean? And they're laughing inside and probably running around the house naked, and I'm outside now, you know? <laughs> Be honest. <laughs> Mom said, how'd you find out? <laughs> One of the reasons this never happens, and, and I'm off script now, so <laughs> obviously, because I didn't put that in my notes, just so you know, I wasn't like, oh, say this at 2237. Um, One of the reasons this doesn't, this doesn't happen is when A, a husband and wife don't have a healthy, life relationship themselves, and so the mom then looks to find her relational needs met in her kids. And when her kids leave, she, there's a void here, and she starts panicking, so she chases. Okay? If there's no fire at home, right, she'll go wherever there's warmth. And so oftentimes, a, 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 a mother's own um, emotional, relational neediness that's not being met by Jesus and her spouse then gets projected on her children. And then the children feel guilty about cutting mom off because they know she's got nowhere to go back to. And so, okay, well, we'll, we'll let her come. The wife's like, honey, I love your mom, but, but, but she, she's been over here three nights a week or four nights a week. And they, he's like, well, honey, where else would she go? And then the husband and wife are in contention. And then you got dysfunction and problems. Not saying you can't love, serve, honor, care for your parents who have needs, but I am saying you can't do it at the expense of your marriage. Right? What's the first thing they say on a plane if it's starting to crash? Don't help your kids. 
Don't help your neighbor. Take care of yourself first. Otherwise, you won't have any oxygen in your head to help anybody else. If you have a dysfunctional marriage because of the toxicity of the marriage or family or household above you, you won't be any good to anybody. And so you have to resolve, we're going to get it right here, trusting that then God will allow us to, to, when we can and as we're able, help those above us without compromising what we have here. Okay? Number three, the protection principle. And, and I'm already behind, and I probably should. Let, let's just read this real quick here. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish but holy and blameless. I know you've heard this a thousand times, but, but let me just read it for us so it's in our heart and I can make this point. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they fed and cared for their body, just as Christ is the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect and honor her husband. So Paul's one of the most thorough teaching on the household in the New Testament is reaching back to Genesis 2.24, grabbing our leave cleave principle, bringing it into the new covenant, and saying that's got to happen in order for the husband to love his wife and for the wife to respect her husband. Now, this protection principle goes as follows. When you are married to your spouse... You, make a, you have a new relational priority. And that relational priority is each other, not your children. It's each other, not your parents. It's each other, not your siblings. It's each other, not your friends. Which means every other relationship in your world takes second place to your marriage. And you refuse to sacrifice the health of your marriage for any other relationship. Now, I'm not meaning to be harsh here because obviously you should have thriving relationships in other places, and that will make you a better husband and a wife. I'm just saying, if you pursue those other relationships at the expense of this one relationship, you're going to be in trouble, and you will be embracing and then carrying on the dysfunction of your former family into your present family. And so the, the, the protection principle means that I love you like I love my own body, which means if it hurts you, it hurts me. Husbands, you got to get this. Because oftentimes, you're not threatened by your mom being in your home. You're not threatened by your, oh, your dad, you know, you know, that's just my dad. You don't care. All the while, your wife is feeling walked on and treaded on and beaten up and violated. And you're like, honey, just get over it. It's just my parents. No. No, no. You're the idiot in the equation. She's needing you to protect her. And it's right for her to feel that way. It's not unreasonable for her to feel violated when your parents come in and walk all over your space. Your marriage is sovereign territory that no one gets to violate. And when your parents come in and are heavy-handed or because they're strong personalities or they're, or they're domineering or whatever it may be, that is a threat to the health of your marriage. And so again, not, I'm, not, I'm not advocating for you to be a jerk. I'm not advocating for you to be ungodly. I'm advocating for you to be godly and protect your marriage which may mean you need to have some hard conversations with your mom or dad after this sermon. First, you go to your spouse. Have, have you felt protected by me? Have you felt, have you felt protected by me in relationship to my family? And if your husband or your wife says no, you got a problem and you got to address it. This is so, so common. I mean, I mean, this is why we've got dozens of these questions. There are dozens of women in this church who feel violated by their family or in-laws and their husbands do nothing about it. And I'm putting you on notice, husbands. It's your job, not the churches. It's your job, not the government. It's your job, not my job, to deal with that. And I'll tell you at the end of the day, it will be better for your family if you do. Because it's not good to allow them to go on in their dysfunction. And they may change, they may not change. That's not on you. What is on you is to guard and protect your marriage. Okay? Maybe your wife feels violated by your buddies. You know what I mean? The one free night you had this week, and hey, babe, and you're out the door with your buddies. Really? It's the law of priority that we talk about often. If you do not prioritize this relationship, all the relationships will suffer. And so, so the husband and the wife have to covenant to protect one another, meaning they never run each other down in public. 
They never talk bad about their spouse to their friends or their family. They, they, they never make fun of them. They, they are always looking to guard and protect and honor and build up their spouse in front of their family members. Man, if you, if you, get, on, if you get on the bash train with your family members, with a spouse, I'm telling you, the, you're on the clock with your marriage. You're just on the clock. So the question you ask all this is, is, honey, do you feel protected by me with our family? And then you give her space, you give him space to be open and honest, okay? And what happens oftentimes is because you haven't protected them, they'll make unreasonable requests in your mind. That's unreasonable. It's because they're starving for air. But when they feel protected, sure, mom and dad can come over. Yeah, hey, we can go to the holidays, sure. The reason your, your spouse doesn't want to go to the holidays or doesn't want to go to the meal is because they know they won't be stood up for. So why go get kicked in the teeth again? So the irony is w- 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 when you're protecting your spouse, they actually open up and are, and are willing to, to extend themselves to your family because they feel safe and protected by you, which means if they're protected by you, they can go into the melee of your family and be totally fine because they know you got their back. And this goes both ways for husbands or wives. And it's a big deal. And, and, and I've talked with couples that have been married 20, 25, 30 years, and this is still an issue. This isn't a new married issue thing. This is a, our, our marriage is broken at its core because I've never felt protected by him. I've never felt valued above her family by her. And the husband has anger. He can't identify toward her family. It's because he's never felt cherished and prioritized by her over them. This is huge. It's huge stuff. Simple biblical principles that when we violate, wreak havoc and continue the cycle of dysfunction in our own family. How was that? We good? <laughs> We're like, it's just like dead quiet in here, you know? It's like, let's kick the fall off by talking about dysfunctional families. Yay! You know, here we go. Okay, well, this is fun. Okay. Question number two, how do I deal with being the only Christian in an antagonistic family of non-Christians? Now, um, I don't mean to sound insensitive, but this was one of my favorite questions. Because there's a ton of you that have met Jesus at Grace City Church. And you're like, I'm, I'm, I'm a first generation believer. I have no clue how this works. I'm like, yes. I mean, let's talk about it. Like, bummer. But like, this is awesome. So I, I, I love that question. The question, was, and we got a bunch of them, and they were passionate, and they were, and they were broken, they were hurting, they were real. They're like, how do I do this? How do I do this? My family makes fun of me. They ridicule me. They, they mock me. They, they, they say I've drank the Kool-Aid. They, they put me down. They, they think I'm stupid. Like, like I've made to feel this big. I'm, I'm the family punching bag since I defi- decided to follow Jesus six months ago or 12 months ago or two years ago. And I love Grace City and I love Jesus and I'm grateful for what God's doing in my life. But how do I survive the antagonism of my unbelieving family? I love that question. Because it means God is starting new works of redemption in broken family chains. God is starting new streams of living water where there was only dry desert and scorpions. God's planting new orchards of righteousness where there was only sagebrush and rocks before. So I'm grateful for you and I'm proud of you. I'm thankful for you. I respect you. I honor you. You're walking the road. I've never had to walk. You're facing challenges I've never had to face. You got to be a better man, a better woman than I've ever had to be in some areas of life. And so I just, I honor you, I hear you, and, and, and I want to be helpful to you as I can. But I want you to be encouraged. I don't want you to leave this morning going, man, there's no hope. No, there's all sorts of hope for you. Look, you're here, you're listening, you're taking notes, you're caring. That, that's evidence enough that God has not left you, right? You could be at home with your family right now making fun of Christians. You're here wanting to learn. That's awesome. So a couple things to keep. That's right. You give them a hand. That's right. We love you and we're for you. And I'm giving my punchline away, but you got a new family. Right here. You look around. This is family. And we're broken and dysfunctional. I mean, just look at Adam. I mean, seriously, you know? I mean, it's like, it's like we all got our stuff. We all got our stuff. But we're family. So a couple things for you to write down. Number one, rejoice. Rejoice. You have a reward in heaven coming. Now, you might not know this yet. Maybe you haven't gotten this far in the Bible yet. I'm hoping you're reading your Bible. But Jesus talked about you in Matthew chapter 5. He said, blessed are you 
when people insult you or persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Uh, one person said, my family lies about me and talks behind my back and it, it never happened until I became a Christian. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus knew that was coming. Rejoice and be glad. What? The people closest to me causing the deepest amount of pain, they've betrayed me. Rejoice? What? Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. He's saying if you're being made fun of because of me, persecuted because of me, ridiculed because of me, shut out and shunned because of me, you're in good company is what he's saying. And there's a party coming in heaven that would blow the circuits, so stay the course. Jesus is saying, look, it might not get better here on earth because things are broken and fallen and people are full of sin and they're angry and they're mean and they're far from God because they're, they're rejecting God and so the, the re- result of that is in their relationships. But hang on, hope is coming. Hang on, heaven is coming. And all that's wrong will be made right. All that's broken will be fixed. And that's why I want to be here this fall for a series called Eternity, Your Life in Focus, because we're going to unpack the reality of what heaven is going to be for those who, who love Jesus. It's, it's going to be incredible. That day is coming. So Jesus says, rejoice, you're in good company. Number two, recognize following Jesus will mean losing friends and sometimes family. And I'm not trying to be discouraging here. I just want you to recognize that that, that may be a distinct possibility. Matthew 10, you will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Don't think, oh, I get saved, I follow Jesus, and now my life will be rosy. No, it might actually get harder. And so we shouldn't be surprised if following Jesus brings persecution. Now, I want to draw a line here. If you're following Jesus and a knucklehead, and you being a knucklehead brought persecution, don't put that on Jesus. <laughs> okay? But if you're following Jesus and honoring people and being godly and humble and loving people, and the persecution still comes, take heart, rejoice. You're in good company and recognize Jesus saw it coming, and that's how he was treated too. Matthew 10, 34, do not suppose that you have come to, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. This is an interesting text. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. See, Jesus talked about in-laws. This is crazy, right? A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. What's he saying there? He's saying, look, here's the deal. When I come, I come to be king in your life. And if there's somebody else who wants to be king of your life, we're going to have issues. Even if it's your mother or your father or a sibling, which means when you follow me, your family might be divided because there's a new king on the throne now. That's okay. Number three, remember Jesus asks you to give allegiance to him over family. And this is where the tension comes in, because you love your family, and you care for your family, and you want to honor your family, which is all good and right, and you care for their eternal uh, uh, soul, and you, care, you want them to meet Jesus. You've met somebody who's changing your life, and you want them to meet him too. But recognize that Jesus asks you to, to give allegiance to him over your family, and they will ask for it. They will ask for it. In fact, one of the reasons they're attacking you or persecuting you is because they intuitively know your allegiances have changed. And they're jealous for it or they're angry about it. And, and so they're, they're, they're going to lash out and they're going to hurt you because they're broken. Because broken people break people. Hurt people hurt people. In some sick and twisted plots, they're jealous for the progress you're making. They're jealous for the health you're experiencing. They're jealous for the happiness that's in your life. They're jealous for the hope that you have and the peace that you have. And they're they're mad at you because they don't have it, and so they take it out by treating you poorly. Just remember that that, that Jesus came to divide. And, And when you follow him, it will mean that you can't follow other things or other people. And so Jesus says, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. This is really strong language. I mean, Jesus created the family. He gave very, very strict instructions on how the family is to thrive. Jesus values the family. He designed the family to be the most profoundly impacting and influencing uh, uh, force in your life. Jesus cares about the family. It was his idea. And yet here he's saying, you can't love your family more than me. What's he saying? Your family can be an idol. 
Your mom can be an idol. Your dad can be an idol. Your family name can be an idol. Your family of origin can get in the way of you following Jesus. And what he's saying is, don't, don't, don't follow me and shun your family. Follow me that in following me, your family might actually be redeemed. Because if, if in following me, it brings these things to the surface, now I got the issues on the table and can deal with them. But you can't love your family at the expense of obeying Jesus. If, you don't, if anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, he's just hitting all the idolatry, isn't he? If you can't let your kid go, you have idolatry issues. If you have a need to be involved in their life at the detail level and still exercise authority and feel like they submit to you after they're 25, 30, 40, 50, however old they are, you have idolatry issues. Jesus says, I'm enough. Love me, follow me, be satisfied in me. Your kids are wonderful, but you don't need them to be happy. And moms, if you do, that's idolatry. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. What's Jesus saying? Is Jesus against the family? No. Jesus is against idolatry. And he's saying, your family will never thrive if you, if you prioritize them at the expense of worshiping me. If you get those out of order, your family's screwed anyways. Love me, serve me, follow me, obey me, and then loving me and serving me and following me, you will become the kind of man and woman that can actually thrive in relationships in your family. Otherwise, it's all going to be out of whack. It's going to be dysfunctional and sick and toxic. Jesus is saying, in the kingdom, there are priorities. And number one priority is Jesus Christ. And if we're not loving him, serving him, following him, we will not be able to be the kind of man or woman in the family he needs us to be. How are we doing here? I'll keep going. Okay, I'm just very quiet room today. Okay. Remember, Jesus asked you to give allegiance to him or your family. Same point. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Those are harsh texts. What's he saying? Don't follow me with a caveat that your family still comes first. <laughs> Jesus is number one, period, I serve him, period. I love him, period. I follow him, period. I submit to him, period. I I, I obey him, period. And then all our relationships work. If that gets out of whack, it's, it's, it's just a train wreck. Number four, refuse to be bitter towards them. Rather, extend love to them. Once your families hurt you, it's tempting to be bitter toward them. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Luke 6, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you, be merciful just as your father is merciful. For some of you this morning, you're in a situation where an an antagonistic family is attacking and demeaning, and God's calling you to love him more than them, and then after you love him, draw down from that love power to love them in ways they've never thought possible, which means when they hit you, you don't hit back. When they ridicule you, you love. When they lie about you, you honor. You, you, you give to them what Jesus is giving to you and refuse to give back to them what they're dumping on you. You love them. You ask the Lord, how, how can I do good to them who are hating me? You ask the Lord, help me to bless them and not curse them. Help me to want to pray for them when they mistreat me. And God, help me to be merciful to them just like you've been merciful to me. Because remember, family, you will never have to forgive any family member who sinned against you more than God's forgiven you in your sin against him. And so you remember that apart from Christ and his Holy Spirit, you're the same. You're, you're just as dysfunctional as they are. But you can be redeemed and made new and you can live a new life and, and, and God just might use you and your witness and, and your testimony to change the trajectory of your family tree. I wish I could tell stories 
of people in this church who found Jesus and then they loved and they served and they honored and they prayed for and they blessed and not cursed and they extended mercy to a family that was just merciless in their, in their torture of them emotionally and mentally and physically and Jesus used it to plant a gospel seed and change the trajectory, not only generations below them, but generations above them. That's called redemption. That's called redemption. Now, don't take on the burden of saving your family. Only Jesus can do that. You follow Jesus. You obey Jesus. You, 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 you live Christ out and his character in you to them, and then you leave their destinies to Jesus. If you, if you carry the burden of trying to get them saved, that will crush you. Okay? You pray for them, you love them, and you ask the Lord to save them. And I'm telling you, I, I've lost track of stories. God wants to save your family, and he started with you. Okay? And it can happen. Can it happen? It can happen. Now, um, set boundaries where necessary. And, and, and I'll just end with this. Um, Sometimes this is necessary. Uh, I, I know godly families who, who moved. They've had to move cities because there was such toxicity with substance abuse or, 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 or ongoing iniquities of sin that, that they, couldn't get f- f- they couldn't breathe free air staying there. And so they, they had to move their families. They still love and they pray, but like, oh, we've got to get out of here. We're, we're not going to make it. And so sometimes you have to set boundaries. It's physical boundaries. It's emotional boundaries. It's not because you're trying to be mean to them or shut them out or say that you're better than them now. You're just trying to survive and get your sea legs under you as a new believer. And, and, and that's okay. Because some of you are coming out of horrible addiction situations. I, we got, we got, I, got, I got another question I'm not going to have time to get to. Some questions were like, I'm the only non-addict in my family. I, I want to love them and show them Jesus, but every time I'm with them, they're into the stuff God is currently saving me from, and I can't do it. That's okay. It's not your responsibility to save them. Jesus can do that. You need to follow him. You need to get the, get the, get the sea legs sturdy. And, and you know your, your boundaries. You know, like, man, if I'm around that, I'm going to be toast. Okay, then, then stand strong and stay away. That's not unloving, that's wise. And that's where I can't tell you what those boundaries are. I, I don't know, but you can seek godly counsel. Hopefully you're in, you're in a group, you're in a DNA, t- you know, with some ladies or some guys, you're, you're in a gospel community group, you're in, and this is where the family of God comes in. We'll help you pray this through this, navigate through, you know, help you walk through this so that you're not harsh but, but, and, and overbearing and unreasonable, but, but, but you don't compromise where you should and thus sacrifice your own health as well. And it's okay to set boundaries. It's okay to set boundaries. It's good for you and it's good for them. Because they've spent a whole life running through boundaries, relational boundaries, and my guess is they don't have a whole lot of healthy relationships around them. So you don't need to be the next victim of their toxicity and dysfunction. Okay? My last question that I won't get to, how do I break from the iniquities and sins of my family? Um, I, I, this was what I was most excited about, that, that I'm out of time. Um, so maybe, maybe I'll write something on the loop this morning. I'll, let me end with this. You were most profoundly shaped by your family, but you are not ultimately defined by your human family. Okay? Which means you are, not a pro- you are a product of your family, but you don't have to be a victim of your family. I want you to hear that. Okay? In Christ, you're not a victim. You're a victor. That's not cheesy bumper sticker language. That's reality. I mean, we were talking on a staff. Our staff. Holy cow. Our staff could get up here and... and, and, and and wow, there are people on our staff who shouldn't be saved, who shouldn't, they should be dead. But in Christ, they're not victims to their family. They've made a choice to walk in the power and the victory Jesus made available to them through the cross. Adam sent me this text, and I think it's so ever we live with. First Peter writes, you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers by the precious blood of Christ. And as the band comes out, as we prepare to end our time with communion, I want that just to kind of sit with us this morning. In Christ, you have been redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you by your forefathers. Not through your own work, not through your you know, moral wherewithal, not through your intelligence, through the precious blood of Jesus that was shed so you could be changed, so you could be saved, so you could be forgiven, so you could be made new, so you could walk in newness of life and newness of power. You do not have to be a victim to your family. Look, look. 
you're not just shaped by your life circumstances. You're, you're shaped by how you respond to your life circumstances. And so your family can be hard and messed up. That, that does not mean that your life needs to be hard and messed up. Your family may be dysfunctional and broken. That does not mean that you must be dysfunctional and, bro- and broken. You, some of the most godliest men I know in ministry came from the most hideous families I've ever heard of. Because God is in the business of proving to the world he's bigger than the enemy. He's bigger than brokenness and sin. He's bigger than demonic powers. He's bigger than the evil one. He's bigger than your poor choices. He's bigger than the dumb things you've done in your own life. He's bigger than all of that. And he loves to take broken people, make them new to show the world he's amazing. And that's why we want more people to meet Jesus and love Jesus and follow Jesus because we want to see more families redeemed and restored and made whole and the dysfunction get pushed back and the light come in. And it may just be that he started with you. In fact, just real quick, if, uh, if you're a first-generation Christian, I mean, you're the first Christian in your family, would you just raise your hand so we can see you? Yeah, we love you. Yeah. Way to go. That's awesome. That's awesome. You're not an orphan. He didn't leave you alone. He said, I want that one. And he came for you. And it just might be that he might use you to break the dam. The enemy had held back the the gospel waters of life and he uses your life to break the dam. But here's the deal. You won't break the dam by violating God's principles. You got you to get God's principles in your head and heart. You got to walk in the spirit. You got to be increasingly more like Jesus. And you watch how Jesus uses you to plant seeds and grow gospel fruit. It might not be this week or next week or a month or a year from now. But you'll email me in five years. Like, hey, guess what? But I came to church six months ago. He met Jesus and this man who abused you verbally or physically or other ways is now going to become a new man because of what God is doing in your life. That can happen. We have faith for it. Amen. Let's stand together as we prepare to worship and take communion. And let's, let's have in our heart those members of our family who don't know Jesus this morning as we take communion, remembering that because of the precious blood of Jesus shed on the cross, we don't have to be victims to the empty way of life handed down to us by our forefathers. And think of the new life your children will have that you never had because of what God's doing in you. Isn't that exciting? So Father, we're grateful that you do massive works of redemption where there was once only death, decay, and destruction. We're grateful, Father, that we don't have to be victims of our circumstances, but that because of Jesus, we can walk in victory above our circumstances. We're grateful, Father, that because of Jesus, you give us the power to love hard people, to be gracious to ungracious people, to honor your word and to walk in truth, but to also have boundaries and, and, and protect what you're doing in our marriages and our families. Lord, I pray you would give these dear people here wisdom to know how to follow you and to employ these principles in a way that would honor you in their relationships. And Father, where there is dysfunction, where there is unhealth, Lord, would you give them eyes to see it? And Father, where there are things they can honor and appreciate and be grateful for in their families, would you give them eyes to see that too? Lord, would you give them eyes to see grace extended to them through their mom or through their dad that they'd never seen before? They could find things to honor their family members. Hey, thank you for doing this. And I never, I never realized this before, but, but, but you did this, so you said this, and that helped me, and, and I'm grateful for that. So, Lord, where there are areas and things that, that, that we can honor our families, would you give us eyes to see those? And then where there is dysfunction and unhealth and toxicity, would you give us courage to, to take a, a gentle, gracious stand against that so that it doesn't affect us and poison us and blow up what we're trying to build? And in all things, Father, give us your spirit to be merciful and tender and gracious in all things we say and do, that in everything we say and do and and how we live and how we behave and how we follow you, that you just be proud and honored by, by how we live our life. And so, Father, we're coming to your communion table this morning, grateful for your son, Jesus. We need more grace, Father. We need more help. We need more power. We need more wisdom to follow you in a way that honors you, and we're asking for it now. As your children, we're just coming to you now. So with just our heads bowed, 
just talk to the Lord. If you've got a family member or you've got a spouse you need to talk to, confess sin, ask for forgiveness, you've got to talk to some family members. I, I don't know whatever your thing is. Let's just, let's just pray, ask the Lord for help and wisdom. Let's lift up our family, our, our spouses, our moms, our dads, our cousins, our brothers and sisters. Let's just move into time of worship and prayer, lifting those up God's put in our life that we might be salt and light to them and show them the power of Jesus in our life, even as he works redemption in us and then through us to them. Here's what hit me as, as we were singing. Some of you, God has called to be spiritual pioneers. And it's rough. I mean, there's bears and tigers and mountain ranges and no homes or cities yet. I mean, you're cutting a new path into a w- uncharted territory. So it's it's going to be hard. And you may never see the city grow. But you'll plant your farm. You'll say... By God's grace, my household, we're going to serve the Lord. And you'll work the grout. And you'll trap beavers. And you'll survive winters. And you'll lose kids and, and, and have kids. And you'll fight off roving bands of bandits and Indians. And you'll, you'll just gut it out. And then you'll die. And a hundred years later, there'll be a thriving city there to pioneers do. Some of you are those spiritual pioneers. You, you, you'll never see the new city grow up. But in Christ, he promises nothing said or done is wasted. I mean, if you follow Jesus, love Jesus, serve Jesus, nothing you say, nothing you do, nothing you, you, you live out in your life will be wasted. And it just might be that one day in your family, there's a thriving gospel city because of the fields you plowed and the winters you survived. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. James. Yeah. Yeah. That's what makes the family of God so awesome, right? You have a new family. And in this new family, you get to learn new patterns of behavior, new patterns uh, of how you you can be loved and you can love and and you you can have all the, the... neuron mapping that got set in your DNA as a three-year-old reworked because you're in a new family that, that, that doesn't ignore health or, or excuse me, doesn't ignore dysfunction but, but identifies it, acknowledges it and, th- and then deals with it. It's, it's, it's not a sin to be dysfunctional. I mean like, hello, look at me. I mean, I can't hardly dress myself. I mean, we all got our stuff, right? But at Gracie Church, we refuse to live in our dysfunction. We're going to move forward. We're going to identify it. We're going to call it out. We're going to repent of it. We're going to, we're going to ask forgiveness for it. We're going, to get some, we're going to move forward. We're going to make progress together in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. You can come in broken. We just love you too much to leave you there. So, we, so that's what the church does. That's why you live in communities. That's why we gather in groups during the week because you need each other to learn from and to grow from and, and, and to seek counsel from and to pray because life is hard. Life is just tough. The winters will be hard, and you may never see the city. That's why you need community. Go, hey, keep plowing. Keep hunting. Keep fighting. Because one day there's going to be a city here. You may not live to see it, but it'll be here. Never underestimate the power of God in your life through Jesus to do things beyond your wildest imaginations. And remember and rejoice. There's a reward in heaven coming that will make it all worth it. Amen?